started, you know, as a young man, he said, now, he said, and he was very boisterous in his leading and so forth, and he said, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I think he missed it. I think he missed it. And so, anyway, let's, uh, let's take off, and we'll, we said last week, and very quickly now, uh, the bold judgments compared to the trumpet judgments. You remember we had, we had the seal judgments, we had the trumpet judgments, we had the thunder judgments, and we had the bowl or vial judgments. But the comparison is between the, uh, the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. The first four affect the earth, sea and island waters, and sky. The, the second three affect humanity itself. Now, when we come to the bowl judgments that differ uh, from the trumpet judgments, the bowls are complete judgments. The trumpets were only partial or one-third of things were destroyed. The trumpet judge, secondly, the trumpet trumpets offered repentance to unbelievers that were living during that time, during the tribulation, the last part of the tri tribulation, the bowls do not. And number three, mankind is indirectly affected by several trumpets. The bowls affect mankind with every judgment. And so we read these first three uh, <coughs> verses, and the first um, of the judgments was grievous sores, and we said that these were sores that would break out on, on uh, people's bodies that had received the mark of the beast or had worshipped uh, the beast or the image of the beast or had the, uh, the mark in it, or their hands or their, or their, uh, or their foreheads. And so we, we see that, and uh, the first angel pours that out, and it was noisome. In other words, when it came upon people, people screamed out in pain. That's what that means. They screamed out in pain, and it also was grievous. In other words, this, this is not, we're not playing around now. This is serious. This was something that they would try to rush to the hospital for. And so that was, uh, uh, and we said it was like the, the plague like the boils that were in uh, the time of Moses. And, um, and, and that's very interesting there. And then the second bowl that was poured out, found in verse 3, uh, was, as it was poured on the earth, it was like, it was blood like that of a corpse. A corpse. Nasty. Nasty. Uh, no life. Uh, remember the, what the Bible says: the life of the uh, life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, in fact, if you can take the blood and do a Bible study all the way through Scripture, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, you'll find that it's repeated over and over again: the life of the flesh is in the blood. By the way, the life of the soul is in the blood. Uh, the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, and now the blood of Jesus in the New Testament. So uh, uh, blood is very important, and so we find that this, and what happens is uh, not only do these people have these grievous and noisome uh, uh, sores on their body, but now we have the, the seas have been turned to dead men's blood, and uh, and everything in the C is now uh, is now being destroyed. So all the all the creation of God. Now think about that. All the creation of God. The whales, the dolphins, the sea creatures, all of the fish and all of the ocean-going fish and the, uh, are, are are dying off. Now you re and you realize, you realize when God created that, even when the flood came, those didn't go on the ark. They stayed where they were. 
and they made it right through. So the, the, the animals or the fishes that are going to die in the sea, it was their great, 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 great grandfather <laughs> that God created. You, you follow what I'm saying? The, these, are, the, these are a staple that God has given us all through the ages, and God's going to take them and, and wipe them out. Now, the third is found in verses 4 to 7. Uh, and, and again, it gets, it gets, believe it or not, it gets a little worse each, each step that we make along the way. And the Bible says here, and I'm going to break it down a little bit, it says, And, a, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the waters, or the rivers, and the fountains of the waters, and they became blood. Now, this is not dead man's blood, but this is just blood and became blood. Now, and I want you to understand that when this angel, this third angel, and by the way, all these angels have been chosen by God from, I believe, eternity past to this very moment. This is your job. Uh, and through all these uh, judgments, angel after angel, after 28 different angels are going to be assigned these uh, the, these jobs to do. And, and so the third angel poured out his vial upon the earth. It turned all of the fresh, now I want you to understand this, it turned all of the f fresh water to blood. Now, think about that. The rivers, the fountains, the wells, the springs, all the fresh drinking water was turned into blood. Now, how long can man live? And, and this is, I think, an interesting maybe caveat that God's teaching us. But how long can man live without water? I mean, this is not, this is not bad water that you, you go and, and like some of the cities have had to do, and you boil the water, but after you've boiled it, you can, you can drink it, Right? You can't boil this blood and then drink it. So how long can people last without water? Yeah, two, three days at the most. So, so I want us to think about this. Again, it doesn't say this, but, but I want you to think about it. I mean, because it just makes sense. If the third bowl is all the drinking water in the world turns to blood... And, and, and we need water, we can't last without water more than three days, these judgments are fast judgments. They're not prolonged judgments. They don't, they, they're not going to last a month or six months. They're going to last days. And they're going to come one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another. And so, so first of all, people are going to be hit by these uh, awful sores that are on them, and they're going to cry out because of the pain, and it's grievous and it's noisome. Secondly, all the sea is going to be turned into a dead man's blood. This is, I, I tell you what, this is, this, is the, this is the worst horror story anybody could ever write. And it's true. And then the third, all the drinking water will be turned into blood. And so I, I, want us to, uh, I want us to look at this for just a second. And, and I want you to take your Bibles for just a second. This is not in the notes, but take your Bibles and go back to the book of Exodus. I, I just love this story. But Exodus chapter 7 And you remember that Moses, Moses' life was basically broken down into three parts. The first part of Moses was, uh, was his, his, his life in Egypt. He was raised by his mother, but, but when he became of age, he moved into the house of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's sister raised Moses. And God spared Moses because God knew that he was going to use him to deliver the Jews. 
And then remember that he uh, saw a Egyptian hurting an Israelite and he took his life. And then he ran for his life and the next first 40 years, Egypt. You could not imagine the wealth of that time that Moses was lavished with. I mean, you, t you talk about being at the top of the game. The top of the game. The second 40 years was spent in the desert in, 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 uh, among the Midianites. Okay? And so Moses was out, and God began dealing with Moses, and all of a sudden he's out uh, watching the herds, watching the, the sheep, and all of a sudden he sees this bush catch on fire. Well, I'm, I'm, that's not an unusual thing because lightning would come and a bush would catch on fire and, and you have to be careful it didn't you know, go to another bush and so forth. But he looked and, and then he, I'm sure, got busy with something else and then he turned around and it's still burning. And Moses was really intrigued by that. You have to understand, he had a formal education. He was not an ignorant man. He, he had the best education that could be had through the teachers in, in Egypt. And so he went, and, and as he got closer, the vo a voice out of the, out of the uh, bush said, uh, Moses, take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. Now, how fast do you think you could get your shoes off? Maybe they're just flip-flops and you just let them flop, right? And God began to tell Moses what he wanted to do with him. And I believe this is true about every Christian. There needs not only... There, there's, a, there's a couple things I think are very important here. If you can grasp this this morning. The first thing we need to grasp is that salvation comes by faith, not by works. Right? We, we would all say that's correct, right? Okay. The second thing is that, and Brother Jim, you, you dealt a little bit with this this morning, that our growth and our service for the Lord comes by faith and not by works. Okay? Now, works is, works, <laughs> faith comes first and then works. Now, works without faith is what? It's dead, but if you have faith, you will have works. God's going to put something into your heart that's going to make you act like a Christian. And you're going to say, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I, how can I best serve you? It's not, by, it's not by what someone does. It comes by, and we, we, we're dealing with this on Wednesday night, but it comes by God's choice. God chooses us. But he chooses us according to our heart and our desire by faith to let God use us. No, that's a scary thing. I mean, in my, my, in my generation, when I, you know, uh, my, my, I, and I had, I, I think I've said this at least sometime lately, but I had several groups of friends. I had my neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood kids were my friends. And we'd get together and we'd play baseball and, and uh, football and everything. So they, I had neighborhood friends. Then I had school friends. Uh, and, then, and then I had, I had um, uh, ath athletic friends. I played, I played sports. I had athletic friends. Uh, and, then I had, and then I had work friends. I had people that I worked with. I, you know, and I'd see them when I went to work and... and uh, now, now, you guys said everybody's complaining about how much they make, and I'm sure some of you started out less than this, but I started out at 90 cents an hour. 
90 cents. Man, when I got a raise to a dollar an hour, I thought, man, that's the best thing I've ever heard of in my life. One dollar for every hour you put in. But anyway, and then, and then the last were my church friends. I had a lot of friends. I, and, but right now, probably my dearest friends are not only the people in this church, but the, the kids that I grew up with. But the kids that I grew up with, you, you know, we, we're going to have a missions conference. I don't know if you, you heard that before, but we're having a missions conference this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Don't miss it. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be like, I'm, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not hyping this thing, but it'd be like I'm saying, uh, Charles Spurgeon's going to be here, D.L. Moody's going to be here, Billy Graham's going to be here, and, uh, and, uh, and um, who's uh, the guy in Chicago? Uh, Dwight Moody's going to be here. That's the kind of missions pro program we've got set up. It is going to be phenomenal. Don't miss it. But anyway, we thought, man, if you got called to the mission field or if you got called into ministry, God is going to send you somewhere over on the far corner of the earth and you'll never be heard of ever again. That was the concept we had about missions and about serving the Lord. I mean, you, you, just, you lose control. Do you, do you know as human beings, we don't like to lose control? Have you noticed that about yourself? I mean, we want to have everything under control. And we want everything to be our way. You know, uh, I did it my way. Boy, thanks, Frank. And, uh, and we, we, we just, we just kind of, that's, that's the human nature. Well, God says, if you'll turn your life over to me and lose control, you will have a better life than you could ever have if you try to stay in control of your life. And that's what he was talking. And so God started talking to Moses. Aren't you glad I didn't forget where I was? Uh, I, I kind of worried about that a little bit. But so anyway, so we come back to Moses and God's talking to Moses. And, and he says, I'm going to use you to go back to Egypt. Well, that had to scare him a little bit. Because the last time he was running for his life. But you're going to go back to Egypt, and you're going to get the people out of there, and you're going to take them to the, back to home. You're going to take them home. And Moses, the Bible said he had a speech impediment. I had a preacher one time said that was a southern accent, but I don't believe that at all. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, but, he, but he had a speech impediment, and he said, I, I, I can't talk, right? We well, said, well, who's that standing next to you? He said, well, Aaron, my brother my older brother, well, let him talk. But Aaron didn't talk. Moses talked. And so he sent him back to there, and, now, and then they meet with the what? With Pharaoh and all of his magicians and things. And so Moses said to Aaron, Aaron, take your rod and throw it down. And it became a serpent, became a snake. Not a little tiny little gardener snake, but it became a snake. And so Pharaoh calls the magician and says, man, that's nothing. And he said to the magicians, hey, you guys, make some, make some, make, take your rods and make snakes out of them. And they did. And there are all these snakes, you know, good thing Indiana Jones wasn't there, right? <laughs> snakes! All these snakes r r uh, going around. And, and so Pharaoh's sitting back in his chair and saying, yeah, you don't have nothing on me. And so all of a sudden, Aaron's rod, that's a snake, goes and swallows all the other snakes and becomes back to Aaron's rod again. Well, I'd like to see that, wouldn't you? And so, and so Pharaoh says, I'm not going to let you go. So anyway, so what does he do? He goes out and he takes that same rod and he hits the, the, the Nile River. And it became blood. So God is duplicate, and, and that was their drinking water. But you see, it was only for a time, and Pharaoh said, you can go. But then he repented. 
because God had nine other special things for him. But see that, but see, you see the correlation? That was, that was a temporary test, a temporary judgment that God did, but he took away very fast. So it didn't destroy a people. But this gives people probably about three days to live. Okay, so that is the what? That's the third vial. Now, let's go, go a little bit further. And, and I see, I love how the Bible fits together. You know what Brother Jim was saying this morning in his Sunday school class, he said, uh, Jesus said, you, 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 you didn't seek me out. You did not seek me out because I did, a, I did what you think was a miracle. You're seeking me out because you needed breakfast. I fed, fed you supper last night. You, what you wanted was breakfast this morning. And then they asked the question, what can we do? We want to do that kind of stuff. And that's the problem. we got to be very careful what we tell God we want to do. Because it's God who tells us what to do. Yeah. Now listen to me very carefully. There are rules in the, in the Word of God. There are rules in the Word of God. And when God says something, now he's gave us the Ten Commandments, but he gave us a whole bunch of stuff to make our life better. And when we start ignoring what God's told us, we're going to be in a heap of trouble. But when we do what God tells us to do and we stay with it, you say, well, it's hard sometimes. Yeah, absolutely it's hard. Do you ever go to work? That's hard. There is no easy job. Man was created with, with what? Days, a few days of, of, of misery. Or like Brother Jim says, you know, they, they live a life and then they die a blockhead. So uh, anyway, but life is, look, can we admit it? Life is hard. The difference is, do you want to go through life, the hardness of life with Christ or do you want to go at it by yourself? That's the difference. And young people, the best thing you can do is give your life totally to Jesus and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And I surrender to you. If, it, if it's to be a doctor, you say, well, God wouldn't call somebody to be a doctor. Sure he does. Or a, a hard worker, or a preacher, or a missionary. But we've got to stay open to what God wants for us, not what we want God to do to do for us. Correct? Okay. So now we come down to the next verse, verse five. And it says, and I heard, and the, and I, 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 man, there's a lot of angels that have been assigned certain things. Angels is really an interesting subject in the Bible. These angels had jobs. And I heard the angel of the waters say. Now, what have all the waters been, happened to all the waters? They're blood now. And here's what he says. The angel of the water says, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be. In other words, what you were, what you are, and what you always will be. Because thou hast judged thus, for they have shed... Now, I want you to grab a hold of this. Why did God do this? Because they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. It's what they deserve. We have lost our mind in America today. We've lost our mind when it comes to justice. 
We see somebody do something horrible, we just let them out. So they can do something horrible all over again, and we let them out. And it's a, it's a revolving door, and we're paying the price for it because people are afraid to go outside now. For they're worthy. Now, let me ask you a question. Why, why, would, the fir- why would the first miracle or the first judgment from, from God through Moses, why would it be that he'd take his, his staff, his rod, and, and touch the water and it would turn red? According to this verse, for they are worthy. Why were they worthy? Well, okay, but let's go back a little bit. Because they killed the little babies three years of age and under. They shed their blood. Um, Let me just say this, and and I, I say this kindly, but if you've had an abortion, if you had an abortion, God's forgiveness is there for you. But these people who are saying, on the television and on the news. I'm going to get pregnant just so I can have an abortion. When the judgment comes, they're worthy of drinking blood because why? Because they're worthy. Now that's not, that's not, that's not killing because soldiers kill. That's murder. You, you with me? And I think we have to be very careful. And, and we got to teach our girls, because they're getting all this malarkey in the school system. We've got to teach our girls, listen, this is, what, what, what is conceived inside of you is a holy thing. Jeremiah says, I'm, God, God says in Jeremiah, I made you, and I know you, and you're inside. In fact, when Jesus... Uh, inside of Mary met Elizabeth where John the Baptist was inside Elizabeth the baby jumped because he knew who was there he knew it's Christ And you know what he's saying? The angel is saying, God is righteous in this. He's righteous. He's holy. He's righteous. He's holy. Lord God Almighty. As horrible as that seems to not give people water, to, at least water to drink, and they're, and they're going to be dead in three days. I mean, it sounds awful, 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 but God is righteous in doing that because he's holy. So the angel of the waters speaks up. You're righteous. They shed the blood of saints. Let them drink blood. They, the unbelievers, are worthy of blood. Then comes the next verse. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Who's this out of the altar? I believe personally it's those gathered underneath the altar, the martyrs, those that have been killed through the Old Testament and New Testament for their faith in God, in Jesus Christ, I believe it's them that were sacrificed and their blood was shed. They cry out and say, not only what was, is, does the angel of the water say God is righteous, we're saying God, God is righteous. We are watching our vengeance come true. By the way, that's why as Christians, we need to be very careful that we don't take vengeance in our own hand. God says, I will repay. You see, what's tough about that is we have to wait a while. We have to wait a while. 
But I'm going to tell you, there's nobody that has been attacked for, their, for the cause of Christ that will not be avenged in these final judgments. And it ought to give us peace in our heart because God's still in control and he's righteous in what he does. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now, I know this is going to shock you, but I'm going to stop there. Now, in my early days, if I was preaching this, I would have, I would have said there's 27 vials, and we're going to finish them all today. <laughs> but there's too much in the next vial. I don't want to just start it. Well, let me just, let me just read the verse and, and give you a little bit of what's going on next. In verses 8 and 9, this is, this, is, this is the fourth vial. It's searing solar heat that scorched, scorched the unrepentant. It says in verse 8 and 9, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give God or him glory. Let me just say this one thing. I understand why wicked governments are fighting so hard For what? Control. For control over the environment. Because Satan knows, they don't know, but Satan knows what's coming. And he knows that God is going to scorch the earth from the heat of the sun. And they're trying to control that. And, and evil governments are trying to what? They're trying to help Mother Earth. <laughs> and they're trying to keep it from getting hot. And, and no more climate change. And if we, if we stop a few smokestacks, it's going to all change. Now, now wait a minute. I, I also know, I've, I don't see much of the smokestacks in China. I don't see much of the smokestacks in India, and I don't, smoke, uh, I, I don't see much of the smokestacks in Russia and the rest of the world. I'm telling you, if they stopped every smokestack in America, it would not stop anything. Judgment, listen, listen to me very carefully, judgment is coming. Christians, if there's ever a time to support missions, it's now. If there's ever a time to be a witness for Christ, it's now. If there's ever a time to invite people to church, it's now. And isn't it interesting that the closer we get to the judgment, the more resistant people are to the escape. Does that not fascinate you? Yes. It's like a guy that's standing on a road and he knows, you know, a quarter of the mi a mile down there around the bend, the road, the road is broken. The flood came through and took out the road. And he's standing there waving his arms, waving his arms, and people are just going by him 70 miles an hour going off into the ravine. And you're saying, what's wrong with these people? People like to come and say, have a good day. God bless you. You're going to prosper tomorrow. No matter how hard today gets, it's going to be better soon. That doesn't help, guys. The only thing that helps 
is people putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So that when God the Father says it's time, we all go up together and shout hallelujah when we get to the portals of heaven. Let's pray. My Father, I, I wish I had better words. I wish my mind and my vocabulary and my tongue worked better so I could really try to explain this better to the people. But Father, the best I can do is just to repeat what you've said. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God this morning will take these truths, this, the, 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 the blood, all the water, all the fresh water being turned, all the drinking water turning into blood, that the population of those that have have the mark of the beast and have worshipped the beast and worshipped his image and have taken on the mark of 666, all of them are going to perish, perish in these plagues, the noisome and grievous sores, the, the, the oceans turning to dead man's blood and the waters, the fresh waters turning to blood. Those are nothing compared to what hell's going to be like. Father, help us to get off of our complacency. And be concerned about the souls of men. Not only in America, but the souls of men were great revivals taking place in the Philippines and down in the, down in the Dominican Republic and other places in Haiti and other places around the world where there's great revival taking place. And if we can't, if we can't interest people here in America, let's send some people where it'll help. People can be saved. When we get to heaven... There's not going to be Americans and Filipinos and Africans and Europeans and South Americans. We're all going to be one in Christ. Amen. But help us to be concerned about what you're concerned about. The heartbeat of God is missions. The heartbeat of God is people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves the person farthest away from God as much as he loves me. And he deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Move us. Move us. For your heart. For the world. If there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus, may they get saved today. Someone needs to join our church, may they join our church today. Someone needs to have someone pray with them, may they pray this morning with someone down front. Bless this invitation. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>